Fellow compatriots, good evening. A couple of days ago, the chairperson of the governing council, His Excellency Sisiku Ayuktabe, presented the State of the Struggle Address, in which he outlined the state at which we are with the struggle, and in which he issued the rally cry for our people to join the struggle en masse, and for each and everyone to play their part. Riding on the back of that speech and the address by the chairperson of the governing council is a presentation of the nation's blueprint. This blueprint presents a roadmap of Southern Cameroon's Ambazonia Governing Council as led by the Executive Council. It is a presentation that covers the political, the social, and the economic vision of the Governing Council. It details a plan that will enable Southern Cameroonians to take full charge of their own destiny and to have full control over their resources. The question, therefore, is to find out if our, the mere goal of our struggle is to restore our statehood. Is that all we are looking for? Is that all we are asking for? We need to answer the question that goes beyond just the restoration of statehood. It is about the value added that will enable us to be the 55th African nation. We need to be able to justify why the African Union and its affiliates should recognize us as the 55th African nation. We need to show the world what is the value that we are adding, because we cannot be just another state. And as we talk to investors and to friends of Southern Cameroons, the question that they continue to ask us is, what is it that you are offering the world? We therefore need to be able to answer that our, our role and our goal is not just to restore what has been taken from us, but to be able to offer the world something better than the world has experienced from us. So the question we should be asking is, what kind of Ambazonia do we want? Located in the heart of the Gulf of Guinea, Southern Cameroon is also sitting in the heart of the oil-rich region spanning from Angola all the way to Nigeria. Now, this is very important, and we all need to understand just how strategic Southern Cameroons, Ambazonia, and where the Ambas Bay is, is how strategic it is. When one imagines how much oil Nigeria produces as a country, going through our nation, and then further down all the way to Angola, you can only but conclude that we actually are at the very heart of the Gulf of Guinea where there is this oil wealth. And that is something that we offer the world. But we offer more than that. The vision and the blueprint also envisages and envisions the creation of a business and services paradise for the sub-region, including ECOWAS and CEMAC. Now, we need to continue to remember that on our left is a neighbor that has got over 200 million inhabitants. And on the right are neighbors who will have over 50 million inhabitants. So we need to, start to position ourselves as the economic hub of that sub-region. And therefore, we need to start telling our investors, our potential investors, our, our vision is to create the single if you look at the Juba of that, of that region. We want to be the investment haven of that region. And services is something that we want to offer the world beyond the wealth, the natural wealth of our nation. Now, it is important, therefore, that we understand the geostrategic importance of our nation. And like I've said, we've got over 250 million potential um, customers, clients that we service as a country. But it is also important to state that Southern Cameroons and the Ambas Bay is the gateway to Western Central Africa, a lot to Central Africa. When we think about the that will de definitely want to make use of our very rich and diversified coastal region and our coastal offering, including our deep sea port. Therefore, we have got that to, to give to these nations as the value added, especially because these are assets which are lying there and not being used. Now, what must we consider as we move forward? I mean, and looking at even the, the, the wealth of what we, we are producing as a nation, cocoa, coffee, oil, boxes, everything, 
becomes important that we need to look at all of this and what we are offering the rest of the world. But before we get there, it is important that we are in the state of annexation. And before we can get to the point where we our potential clients and investors can invest, we need to try and ensure <clears throat> we need to first of all try and ensure ourselves of the vision and the book will start and we have already started but now we have to reinforce um, our our strategy of disengagement this is very important homeland disengagement what is we want to separate the court whatever it is that links us to Yaoundé and that is the policy of disengagement that we are going to put in place that on one front there's going to be disengagement in terms of denying and undermining Yaoundé's influence on our people. We want to ensure that those things that Yaoundé has for people, the aspects has used to people, we need to start breaking. And that means we want to start, for instance, ensuring that we start to trade with other partners directly, bilateral trade agreements. We want to make the market. Want to start using our maritime um, offerings and ensure that we start to explore them. But very importantly, we want to it happens amongst our people. The education system is going to be controlled by our people, and as a result, we are disengaging from Yaoundé and taking control of our day. Um, abroad, beyond our territory, we want to ensure that we set up a governance system. We set up a governing system that our people to be able to go out there and represent themselves. Some of the things that we've put in for instance, the establishment of our own television station, the SCBC, the establishment of our own governing council, the establishment of the different branches of our people, our community, and most of all, the fact that not long from now, we want to start to establish diplomatic ties and diplomatic presence in different countries. So, to sum it what we are going to do is that we are going to pull the block on Yaoundé. This will define our disengagement policy vis-à-vis -vis Yaoundé. And like I said, it is important that we start to move it. For a market of over 200,000, 200 million people, why should we be putting our resources and our energies into 18 million people? Of course, we are not closing the door on potential market towards 18 million people, but we will also be looking at the market of 200 million people and beyond because our offering goes beyond these two territories. And that is why we are looking, about, uh, we're looking at establishing a bigger presence beyond our territory. Now, how are we going to operationalize this blueprint? It's easy for any nation, every country, every group of people to sit and put down on paper the things that they are going to do. It is easy for nations, and as we have all seen, for us to come up with policies and things that we think we can implement. But the difficulty remains the implementation of these policies that we put in place. And that is why we have decided to put in place and establish a number of entities and mechanisms that will enable us. One of the key mechanisms is ensuring that we are able to generate our own revenue, generate money, generate the funds that will enable us to achieve these goals that we've set for ourselves. As you may know, we presently have the Southern Cameroons, the Southern Cameroons uh, Public Affairs Committee, SCAPAC, whose role is to ensure that it plays the treasury for us. It governs, and it, that is why it has put in place uh, a board of directors to ensure that there is good governance around our funding. But even more, and in order to move us forward, a decision has been taken that the board of SCAPAC is going to be reconstituted, which means a lot of members will be selected and elected from the different member countries which constitute SCACUF, and they are then going to take over the governance of SCAPAC to ensure that there is good governance and there is transparency in terms of how our funds are being used. Also, there is the SCBC, the Southern Cameroon's Broadcasting Corporation. We want to ensure that our television station now undergoes a transformation that, does, that not only sees it 
continue to operate smoothly and wonderfully, but ensures that there is good governance, that programming, there is accountability, and that it is owned by our people all over the world. And in the coming days, the, the board for SCBC is going to be set up. The board is going to be made up of people from different countries across Africa, Europe, America, and even as far as China. But even more, there's going to be an editorial board to ensure that the programming uh, and the programs of SCBC go in line with what our movement wants for our people. Moving further, uh, and like I explained, we are going to be establishing SCACOF offices and a presence of the Southern Cameroon's governing body, the governing council across different countries of which make up our people. And one of such countries is the United States where the presence, while our people, there is this euphoria of the struggle and what our people are, are contributing, there has not been formal structures of SCACUF being set up. And as decided at the last conclave, the United States is going to be constituted of six key regions where we will And the ethics committee is going to be made up of some of our elderly, our elders and our leaders from across the world to ensure that it continues to provide the moral, um, the moral guidance to the leadership structure. Now, social engineering. It is important, therefore, that as we proceed and start to put in place all these structures and the, the, the mechanisms that will take our struggle forward and ensure that we are successful in this disengagement policy, we also ensure that we build the capacity of our country and run it with it when the time comes. And that is where the social re-engineering starts and takes place. It is important, and as uh, the chairperson of the government council had stated, once we require, we will be capable right from the very beginning to put on the market at least 1.5 million jobs because we will be taking over all those jobs that have traditionally been ours, plus all the jobs that will be created as a result of all these things that we'll put in place. Therefore, human resources is our major asset. When we talk about the oil, coffee, and everything, we want to recognize that what we have the most, the biggest asset that we have. We've been lucky that we have been, we've managed to educate ourselves in spite of the deprivation in us to be able to go back and take over our nation and run with it. And that is why we are confident that we will have 1.5 million jobs at the very beginning. And this will only increase over time. Therefore, there are plans to harness the human potential of Southern Cameroonians across the globe. And that is why right now, we're looking at the people who come with these skills, them on the table right from the beginning, so we start to identify and start doing the We are going to pay special attention to women and ensure as it is for men. Our women have been deprived over time, and that is why it remains important that women, we start to bring women to the fold and, start, and begin to give them their role. One of the, one of the offerings that we have given over time and which remains 
um, one of the bedrocks of our, our, our nation has been education. And substandard as it is that the regime has tried to make it, we have continued to produce some of the best minds and some of the best teachers, best educational institutions in our country. Reason why people not only from country, they come from countries even, even far and send their children to come and study. In, they send their children to come and study schools. Therefore, one of the areas we want to invest, we want to invest considerably is education. And, and we want to build world-class education system, that, a world-class education system that will learn us from all over Africa and even beyond. Why not? For we are going to start identifying and which will embody the structures and the identify those but also identify those which our people don't have and ensure our people have them and bring them to build this new nation that we want we are establishing we ensure that we've got all the skills necessary and it is for that reason that we are the short term policy drive it is a governing council the governing council will make with the Republic a priority. That's one of our short, short disengagement, and it is important that we keep this. The second is to start building alliances with friendly countries across Africa and, and beyond. And financial base. And as you know, many of these things are already happening. We're beginning to establish the relationship with this country. We're beginning, we've already begun the process of disengagement. What we need to do is keep until finalization. And most of all, for us to do that, we need to start to build our financial base. Get more, get our people to contribute more, pay their levies, but most of investment. Now, investment. When we talk about saying we need to start moving from the policy, uh, the policy where we, keep, we tell our people to contribute, contribute, and start to say our people need to invest. And to say, as you make effort towards the struggle and put in your investment and put in your efforts, at the end of the day, you need to be able to get some fruits out of your investment. And moving from the social political part of this, this, this blueprint, I would like to talk about the economic uh, roadmap. And this is going to be the bedrock of everything we put political kingdom, but if our economics are not right, then we've got it wrong. That is the reason why we focus and have put in place a, a very robust economic plan. It will take advantage of this also and thank the different compatriots across the world in different countries who have taken the past couple of weeks to put together economic blueprint. Thank you very much. Now, beginning with our, our economic blueprint, I'd like to talk about the pre-restoration. The pre-restoration goal is basically addresses economic and efficiencies so as to achieve inclusive growth and development, as well as position Ambazonia as a business hub for Central and West Africa, with a target to emerge as a develop, developing economy by 2030. This is very important. 2030 from today is less than 15 years. And what we have in mind as a vision is to say, been deprived for over 50 years, having been deprived of the opportunity to build our own roads, the opportunity to, to, to repair and put in place our own electricity, our own electricity terminals and, and supply chain. We are saying we want to put in place those things for ourselves, and we're giving ourselves less than 15 years to be able to put in place. That is why we look back at where we are coming from, where we are and the deficiencies we have and where we want to see ourselves in the next 15 years or so. And in order to do that, that by building strong institutions, after 56 years of eroded confidence in the public sector, we want to build trust between our citizens and public servants, as well as institute a culture of accountability. For 56 years or so, we know that being a civil servant means to be corrupt. We, to be a civil servant means to be a police officer means to be brutal. We want to build a new culture where when you get lost, you want to approach a police officer and ask him, how can I find my way? And they're going to show you your way home. That is the culture we want to build. 
we want to institute a monitoring and evaluation system at all levels of governance, which means that everybody is accountable for the role they play. It is no longer going to be a matter of walking into an office and somebody is talking over the phone for hours and hours while you stand and wait. That has to change, and these are the things that we envisage moving forward. Lessons learned demonstrate, that the, demonstrate the importance of our police and our military. Our military are there our military is there to defend our people and to defend our territory. Therefore, whatever we do, whatever we do and whatever nation we want to put in place, uh, we will ensure that we invest considerably in our military to ensure that it defends our people and it defends our territory. And the police will be there to ensure that there is, there is law and that there is order. These are priorities for our people. In order for us to accomplish these things, it is important, therefore, that we mobilize resources. Resource mobilization becomes an important component of the plan, of the blueprint. Of immediate concern, of course, for action is self-finance. Our citizens need to start financing these things that we have put in place. And in addition to our citizens, we are presently now looking at the possibility and the potential for donor funding coming in. And we're exploring all of this, the combination of both internal and external donorship. This is what is going to constitute, the, the, the constitute our drive to ensure that we are self-sustainable in the next few years. So we want to be able to generate our own revenue. And in so doing, we will start to invest. Invest in different initiatives which will enable our people to generate funds from the investment and be able to plow those funds into nation building and struggle which we have put in place and have brought us this far but we need to go even further in order to achieve our aims our objectives and ensure that we come out on the other side of the tunnel the one is citizenship, citizens registration um, citizens registration is something that we've been doing it's been great having our people contributing but we want to push and ensure that each and every citizen has pride in nation and start to contribute their, their citizenship levy. Everybody does. We want to be contributing our monthly, um, contribu our monthly levy to ensure that we are able to have in place um, the, the bulk of uh, finance and the, our economy drive our struggle and open the doors for us that need to be opened. Um, there are donations that are coming from our people. would like to see a lot more of this. But there are two key initiatives which we are putting in, which we are putting in place which we hope are going to drive the struggle moving forward over and above the citizenship levy which we have been putting. The one is the Southern Cameroon's Ambazonia Investment Fund, SCAIF. This is a fund that enables citizens to plow and invest money into accounts by the movement and which will, over time, over a period of 12 months, recuperate their money with interest over and above. This is an initiative that has already started, going strong, and we are encouraging each and every one of our citizens to join so that it's, we don't suffer from giving and giving, but we get to a point where we want to start to invest our money and get returns, and yet we are contributing to the struggle. That is, a, is an initiative which is ongoing, and we are encouraging everybody to join. Now, please go or log on to the website to get to know more about this particular funding initiative. And coming in the next couple of days is the Global Ambazonia Freedom Fund. The Global Ambazonia Freedom Fund, GAF, is the fund that will enable our people all over the world, but most especially those in the home front. The people at home who want to contribute to this struggle, many of them who have been calling and asking, how can we contribute? We want this thing to move forward faster. We want to be plowing in money every month. The GAF is going to be the mechanism that will enable them to contributions and take the struggle forward. The GAF is going to be launched in the next couple of, in the next week or so, and it will enable our citizens over the world to be able to make their contributions. And for those who want to contribute anonymously, the GAF is the tool for you to use. Now, restoration economic agenda. I've spoken about the pre-restoration economic agenda, and now once we have done all that needs to be done, make all the sacrifices that need to be made. We need to think about the country that we want to be in the future. In order, once we get to Boya, what do we require? And in 
order for us to get there, we need to do an assessment of where we are and what we have lost so far. I mean, the, the, the least, and I'll talk about a few, being the damages that have been done to our House of Assembly. We don't have a House of Assembly of the word anymore. We do not have our cap. Um, we do not have the power cap we used to have. The Yorker Power Station, PWD, Victoria Airport, and so on. All these assets that used to be ours, our caterpillars, our trucks, which were moved to Yaoundé, and we have to go and beg and go to something that belongs to We have to all these different assets, repair those that are damaged, and make sure that they are in good working condition. These first things will prioritize. And, and of course, education is a very important element. Um, the policy thrust for education is basically to scale down youth illiteracy to a single point and building capacities in the field. And like I said, look for scarce skills, train our people and send them back home so that they can come with these scarce skills and we can start to rebuild our nation. But we also need to adapt local needs to international competitiveness. We need to know that if we operate locally, there's a stiff competitive world out there to do it. Because we've got, like I said, a market of over 250 million people who are looking and waiting to explore and exploit our market, including tourism. We are we continue to be a, a touristic hub for the rest of the world, especially when one looks at our vegetation, our topography, our cultures, the rich culture that we bring. We've got no doubt that tourism in itself is going to be a massive, massive income earner for our country. Now, educational potentials. What are we looking at? We're looking at a large pool of educated Southern Cameroonians, both at home and abroad, to be able to bring their expertise to the fore and ensure that we build this new nation. We but also of the fairly youthful population we have um, and, and, sh and see that we groom this youthful population. So within the next 20 to 30 years, once we get there, these are the groups of people who are taking over based on the education, the grounded foundation in the education that they have been given. Unconscious among the people, which could translate into high literacy, is definitely that we are looking at the potential of our people. Now, when we talk about the education policy action, what are we talking about? We have tried to outline this in terms of the short-run policy action and the medium and long-term policy action. But we are looking at partnering with various stakeholders to rebuild and improve infrastructure in schools. You do, you, some of you know the kind of infrastructure we have in some of our schools. This has to change. Enhance general and vocational training. Establish more teacher training facilities. Um, equip teachers and instructors with relevant delivery techniques and tools, redesign educational curriculum in line with national orientation, emphasize and educate the masses on the benefits of education, pursue a high rate of primary and secondary school intake, institute compulsory and completely free primary and secondary education, create incentives for education like scholarships and employment opportunities, as well as create jobs for various specializations, beginning with the basic ones. But most of all, we would want to invest a lot of our energies into self-employment. We need to move away from the culture where our people go to school because they are hoping to be employed, and to start to inculcate in our people the thinking and the, the culture of employing yourself and employing others. And that is where we want to take it, so that the pressure to employ is lessened, and the private sector in terms of the small and medium-sized enterprises then take over from there. Now, our education policy, medium and long-term, long-term policy action would include to reduce the teacher-student ratio to 1 to 40 and to improve access to, to land for mechanized farming. Now, farming is an important component of our culture. As you know, 70% of our land remains arable but unfarmed. And we want to transform this into mechanized farming for our people and move away from rain-fed agriculture, which is um, hand-to-mouth. We want to be able to start feeding the rest of the sub-region beyond what we are doing right now. Establish more universities in different fields and different schools of the universities in order to meet demand and attract 
foreign inflow of students. We want to be the educational hub that brings students from across the region to come and study in our schools. And that could be a great incumbent. We want to create academic and research institutes, think tanks, whose job would do nothing but to do projections for our government, for our, our local governments, as well as for the different facets of our society. Schools need to be managed at county levels, and teachers are going to be hired based on district of abode. This is very important. We need to move away from this, this policy that the annexation regime in, a, in Yaoundé has made, where it's moving a lot of its people from all over and putting them in our villages. We want to ensure that we build the potential of our people, both in terms of culture and language, right from the level of the county, so, so that by the time they get out of the county, they, we, are, we are sure that they're grounded in wherever they come from and are represented at that level. But most importantly, we want the counties to take over the employment of their people where employment is needed. And, as, and, and in so doing, we are having and putting in place a very decentralized and, in fact, federated system of governance. And we are going to create job pools for almost, for almost all specializations in order to boost and curb unemployment. And like I said, from the very beginning, we have already done the maths, and we think that the, the we, can pr we can provide 1.5 million jobs from the port in Victoria through to the airport, the schools, and everything. We are very confident that these jobs will be created. And of course, we want to have leading institutions in Africa to benefit from our, the institutions that we put in place as a result of education tourism. Now, we have therefore mapped out a number of different areas and sectors which we think are important for us to be able to invest in and for us to be able to build the capacity of our people in. And this includes the management pool, which will include uh, and take into consideration construction project managers, project managers, hospital administrators, foremen, school administrators, farm administrators, as well as estate managers. At the same time, we're going to invest in manufacturing, and this will include cutters, welders, and so on. We want to be able to get our people to start manufacturing based on the natural resources that, that are our disposal. Um, food crop, in, the, in terms of the agricultural um, sector, we want to be able to do food crop production, livestock production, dairy farming, poultry farming, agroforestry, pasture production, herb and vegetable, as well as horticulture. And the list goes on from construction pool, finance pool, where we want to get investment and microfinancing, as well as insurance. I've already talked about education, but there's also the, tech, the, the, the ICT field, where we're looking at information technology, biotech, biotechnology, mineral, energy, agricultural, health, and education technology. All of this we are going to put in place. And finally, of course, there is the health pool, which has got our doctors, our nurses, and, and the different health, health IT, lab technicians and so on. All of these will constitute the skills pool, the skills pools for Ambazonia. And all of these are being looked at by the governing council in terms of the board. Now, talking about the health sector, we have outlined that between now and 2030, we will be able to put in place a, a system of health care for all by the year 2030. Think about the time in the olden days when you would go to the hospital and consult the doctor in a public hospital and be able to get medication for free. Think about the time when you would have, as part of the general health and public health efforts made by the government, you would have the, the, the trucks stop in front of your house and collect the trash cans. This is what we envision and, env and envisage for our people and for our country in the coming years. Therefore, the health sector would see, would see us eradicate the poor and, inad poor and inadequate health facilities that we encounter, that we know today. The lack of medication for personnel with an average of about one medical doctor to 5,000 people is going to be eradicated. Um, we've got aging public sector, public sector health workers, mostly between 41 and 51. We need to start building our new boom of health professionals. Um, inequitable geographic distribution of hospitals and health workers. We want to make sure that the distances for populations covered from one health center or hospital are equitably distributed across the countries, like you do in, in every well-thinking and planned nation. 
with lack of adequate reg regulations and licensing for health workers and no accreditation bodies for hospitals and training centers. That will have to be taken care of. The cultural and local belief that prevent people from seeking health care will have to be eradicated because our people will be encouraged to go to hospitals where they don't need to sit on long queues before they can see the doctor or to pay um, um, enormous amounts of money. We want to make sure that health care becomes accessible to all our people. And the lack of, of computerized um, systems within our hospitals, which has caused a, a bit too many deaths for our people. And when we look at the health sector, we see a lot of potential. There is a fair literacy, literacy rate amongst our people um, in terms of the young people who are up and coming and who can be trained in the health sector, highly youthful, but also we will get, make sure that we involve the private sector in, our healthcare, in the healthcare provision. It is important, therefore, that at the very beginning we start to think about the public-private partnership that will put in place. Our people, those in business, but also the multinationals who will be establishing businesses in our country will have to contribute to the healthcare system for our people. And of course, there is the presence of botanical gardens, the forests and the reserves, which will constitute part of our research around the, um, the pharmaceutical products that our people will produce. So we want to in invest in the pharmaceutical industry for our own people and to be able to exploit and, e and export some of our products. Now, short-run policy of action. What are we going to do once we get there? We are going to meet with the health sector um, meet health sector related requirements of sustainable development goals. As you know, the sustain sustainable development goals move from 2015 to 2030. This is global. Every country in the world has to adhere to that, and we will also be working very hard to adhere to that. We're going to rebuild and improve our health infrastructures. That has already been stated. We're going to locate more health facilities in rural and urban areas. That too, introduce health insurance schemes to improve access to health care to our people at all levels, but also strive to drastically reduce infant and matern maternal mortality rates, which is something that we are having to deal with a lot. In the short run, we will continue to institute electronic records in the health facilities, enact laws that promote best practices in health care services, institute stringent healthy and safety regulations in health care facilities, enhance the continuous training of health care staff to meet the challenging needs of our people, Sufficient, sufficiently well-trained personnel with competency in evaluation mechanism in place, and drug prevention, prenatal, childhood, and chronic disease prevention, and first aid. Now, in the medium and long term, what do we envisage for our people and for our country? We'll strive to eliminate the overuse the, over, the use of over-the-counter drugs will create a conducive environment for indigenous medical personnel to return home, create a conducive environment to attract foreign experts to come work in our country and to be able to impart their knowledge to our people, to reduce doctor-patient ratio drastically, and also to build standard comprehensive tertiary health care facilities that can drive medical tourism. In the medium and long term, we will continue to work to increase national access to universal health care, the repatriation of medical skills located abroad. So we want to get our people who are, have taken their expertise abroad to bring them back home. We want to establish um, specialized training centers for health care professionals. We want to train licensing and accreditation boards for medical workers, health facilities and training, training centers instituting a computerized system of network for everyone's health history, collect and, collect and documentation of that baseline database for comparison and decision making. Now, transport. Transport is the backbone of the economy. Access to transport, farm to market roads are the backbone of the economy. Unfortunately, over the past 50 years, we have experienced a systematic degradation of our roads. In fact, the regime has made it so difficult that we cannot even travel from the one part of our country to the other, and we have to travel across borders to get back to our own homeland. Therefore, transport and transportation are going to be the one, of, one of the key elements that we will focus on 
And like many development experts would tell you, once you have roads, development follows. And that is the maxim that we're going to follow when we, when we start to rebuild our nation. Therefore, what would be our policy thrust? It is to create an efficient and low-cost transportation network to drive business internally as well as externally. State of transportation infrastructure, as it is in our country, as you know, complete or near absence of transport infrastructure for the air, for the sea, and the railroads are completely inexistent. There are few roads existing and passable. There's poor maintenance of roads at all, with few available infrastructure, as well as inefficient transportation means and systems. What potential do we have? As you all know, we've got good access to the seaport, to sea transport. When we look at Victoria, we look at Tiku, Ekundo Titi, and Idenau. And we are going to restore and reestablish all of this. We've got navigable rivers, also found in Manu. We, we look at the Kibi River, we look at the Mesam River, which do not only offer navigation internally, but can also lead to international waters if we restructure them to suit our needs. And of course, when we look at the colonial and post-colonial air sites, the Tiko, Bisongabang, Bali, and Bafut the airports, we realize that there is great potential for internal travel, as well as for some of them, international travel. Therefore, when we look at all of this in terms of infrastructure, we also look at the skills that are in place. Middle skill level fairly available for all these industries that I have mentioned as well as the strategically, strategically positioned gateway to serve the Central and West African market, if well harnessed. Now, when we look at all this infrastructure, we are definitely certain and confident that we will be able to feed the Central and to an extent the West African, um, the West African market once we put in place our road infrastructure. Now, what are we looking at? We're looking at the short-run policy action, which includes to engage public-private partnerships for the development of our infrastructure, to carry out maintenance work on the skeletal transport infrastructure, to design a comprehensive and efficient route infrastructure, construction and maintenance, as well as safety laws, construct 20%, that is 1,200 kilometers of high-standard state-of-the-art bitumized dual carriage highways linking all counties and neighboring countries around us, bitumized over 15%, approximately 9,000 kilometers of county highways. So highways linking all the key towns and villages in the country, and to pave at least 25%, or approximately 22,000 kilometers of farm to market roads, linking the different villages and the different farms to the, to the markets. Continue. We will train transport professionals in all the different fields, institute a services and maintenance culture, refurbish and transform the Bamenda or the Bafut airport into an international airport, refurbish the Bisongabang and Bali airstrips to serve local needs, make plans for the construction of the Tiko Air airport into an international airport, and make plans for the construction of, the local airport in, of a local airport in Kambe. We will refurbish the Limbe Deep Sea Port to serve as the main, or the Victoria Deep Sea Port, to serve as the main anchor point for vessels that would cover West, Central, and Northern Africa. We'll refurbish the Tiko Wharf to accommodate smaller vessels, as well as refurbish the train system to service communities with present access to them. So we want to ensure that for most of our heavy duty carriage and movement, we were going to use the rail transport as well as for some of the urban transportation. And when we look at this and look at the modern train systems, the modern rail systems that have been put in place by the likes of, of uh, countries like Ethiopia, we know that this is not beyond us. When we look at the aircrafts that small countries like Rwanda and others which are <coughs> sorry, far poorer than us, like Ethiopia, have put in place, we are definitely certain that we can make it work for our people. <coughs> now, what are our medium and long-run policy actions? 
we are going to foster public-private partnerships for development of the sector. And I've spoken about all of this. <coughs> um, we are going to construct a local airport in Kambe. I spoke about that. Create a maintenance and repairs overhauls, overhaul system for our airports. Construct the Victoria Deep Seaport to a state-of-the-art seaport to service vehicles. Construct the Tico Wharf. Construct a standard railway system to service industrial areas and international transport hubs, as well as seek for international licensing and certification. So that is the work that we are going to put in place for our transportation system across the country. Now we move into agriculture. <clears throat> the policy thrust for agriculture is to cement place of our country basket of the sub-region. This means that there will be increasing farmers' income and ensure food security throughout the country, will ensure that there is training and provision of agricultural credit, as well as value adding, addition and marketing for our people. Now, what are the agricultural potential that we have? We've got fertile soil, favorable environmental factor, and availability of trained agriculturalists from home and, home and abroad who are going to bring their know-how to the table. The common cash crops that we are looking at developing into wider farm, farm markets include banana, coffee, cocoa, rubber, oil, palm oil, tea, maize, beans, vegetables, cassava, plantains, yams, cocoa yams, rice, potatoes, soya beans, purple, pineapple, avocado. And in fact, we have identified that the Manu area is going to be the center around which we are going to build our avocado, our avocado, massive plantations of avocado to serve the world and to be used in different, different areas, including body lotion for purposes of nutrition and so on. We, this will include animal production, poultry farming, um, cattle rearing, fishing, piggery, and rodents, as well as agribusiness, which will be the uh, transformation of our agricultural products into finished products and export. Now, what policy action do we have in place to realize this? The government will partner with farmers to create an agricultural commodity board. This board will be vested in the responsibilities of training farmers, the provision of improved variety of high quality yield, enhancing access to fertilizer and pesticides, provision of access to micro credit and bank credit, provision of access to marketing services, and train stakeholders in agribusiness activities to enhance value addition and transformation. So there is a policy action plan already in place. We will, our medium and long run policy action will include it to improve access to land for mechanized farming, establish agricultural universities to train specialized agricultural manpower, establish an agricultural bank, foster free trade zones for agricultural products, foster agricultural trade agreements with other countries, including our neighbors, creation of grazing reserves for cattle in order to eliminate cattle grazing conflicts establish cattle ranges for the production of dairy products to serve the central and west african markets as well as develop processing of agricultural products for the international market now moving away from agriculture we now move into the energy resources and as you know we've got them we've got them bountifully and our policy thrust is to partner with private the private sector to build low cost environmental friendly state-of-the-art infrastructure that will service the local economy at the same time generate substantial foreign income from the exportation that we are going to do. Amongst this are our hydropower potentials. As you know, there is the Yoke River in the south region which used to manage the power or used to, to feed the power cam station. There is the Menjum Falls, which we know from our feasibility studies is going to be um, able to feed 
the sub, most of sub-Saharan Africa. And as it stands, it is the second largest hydroelectric potential in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, both of them present very little environmental impact given their locations far away from um, urban settings and where you have human habitat. Therefore, we are confident that they will continue to play a key role in our economy and in our hydropower potential without, with very little, very little environmental impact on our people. Feasibility studies also show that the wind, uh, wind energy potentials w can be found in Njinikom, in Tatum, in Kikakilaiki, in Jakiri, in Biame, in Kambe, in Binshua, in Binka, in Biye, in Batibo, in Gi, in Ngo, in Oshe, in Wum, in We, and in Bum. And all of this, as you know, we are going to be able to use the wind turbines to be able to provide energy for our people and for our activities in all these different locations that we have identified. Um, this will then complement other energy sources and electrification of rural areas and, and some urban areas depending on their capacity. Um, once again, all of these have got very low environmental impact on our population and it's comparatively cheap to exploit over the long term. And as you know, in most, of, in most other countries, developed countries across Europe and, and the Americas, they are already using this, this energy and we think we have got the potential to generate energy in all these different places for our people. Now looking at the geothermal potentials, we see them, the availability on the Mount Fako and the Maninguba areas. This is quite renewable, it's renewable energy and very easy to harness and easy to use. Now we look at biomass potential. This is available everywhere in southern Cameroon, in large quantities in the southern region. Palm oil produced by companies like Palm Oil, CDC, Soka Palm, and residues from forest zones in the south. There is also residual, residual um, agriculture from the Ndop rice, as well as other forest dominated areas. There is fuel, ethanol, biodiesel, hydrogen, as well as power from electricity and heat. Uh, and once again, all of this has reduced environmental pollutants because they are most of them natural, as well as they are easily affordable, especially for use in our rural areas. Potential of oil and gas. Over and above the gas that we know um, is found, the good reserve of oil and gas that is found in the Ndian, Bakasi region, we do know that there are new discoveries in Miselele, Bafut, and other places. And therefore, we will be looking at exploring this and inviting partners to come, international partners to come work with us for their exploitation. Um, and this will be very useful for um, our heavy locomotives like trains and others which we'll be using, with, uh, we'll be using for these energy sources. Now, looking at renewable and short run policy action for them. We are looking to revamp all abandoned energy sources. Like I said, there's a Yoke power plant. Identify all potential sources, their maximum capacity, social environmental hazards, as well as the potential economic benefits that will come from them. Reduce bureaucracy and stem out segregation. And separate the role of regulators from operators, which is not the case with the providers, um, as we know right now. And develop a national energy policy with focus on ensuring energy real reliability and affordability, as well as sustainability and environmental control, as well as pricing. We want to ensure that this is affordable to our people all over the country. We will continue to encourage PPP, public-private in the energy sector for maximum completion, stability of energy both in rural and urban areas, provide incentives for production and distribution, drive energy sector developments so as to be the major provider for both the West and Central African region and introduce the use of electric cars, which is where the world is going today. <coughs> for oil and gas, we will, in terms of action plans, we're looking to identify major reserves, both explored and unexplored, train service providers in oil and gas industry, 
create a national oil company with accountability, different from what we know in Sonara today, enact oil and gas laws that protect the environment and stakeholders, envisage the building of new refineries, create various incentives to attract exploration that will replace depleted reserves, negotiate, negotiate viable joint ventures with international companies, increase profit margins of oil companies through transparency and accountability, and take preventive measures to guard against illegal exploitation um, and oil bunkering. In the medium and long run, we are looking to build other robust power plants to meet the rising international demand in West and Central Africa, to meet at least 90 to 95 percent of domestic demand for energy, to create specialized institutions for energy research and development, enhance availability of energy in both, both rural and urban areas to spur local production of especially small size industries, open doors for innovations, inventions, discoveries, and technological development, as well as foster research partnerships with the energy sector. Therefore, we will be putting in place institutions that will do nothing but research um, around energy, renewable energy, and to build our capacity to, to do better. Long run, um, we envisage the creation of specialized institutions for chemical and petrochemical engineering, building of new refineries, and we've already ident identified Yoke and Rio de Re with robust capacities for export, create a national the income generated from the scales from the sales of our oil and our gas resources. Now, tracking the performance of renewable energy subsector, we want to position ourselves as West Africa's leading provider of renewable energy, which we are confident we are going to give because we know the potential and the, the, the shortcomings of the renewable energy in West Africa. We want to meet at least 90 to 95 percent of domestic energy, track renewable energy contributions to the GDP of our country, track contributions to foreign reserves, track affordability of energy by all revenue generating sectors of the country, track employment generation by the sector in all categories, as well as compare renewable energy status with other countries at the same level of development as ours and see just how well we are faring compared to these other countries. Now, moving from, re from renewable energies, we would like to look at the information communication technology. As you know, information communications technology is the future. Future of the economy as well as the future of education and everything we do. Therefore, we have been able to identify a policy thrust that would see the exploitation of vast opportunities in the di digital age for sustainable growth and development. And of course, comes to mind straight away Silicon Mountain uh, and the mini centers in most towns across our countries where we hope to establish ICT centers. Um, we have the benefit and the advantage of having a, f uh, a very active youthful population, increased ICT awareness amongst all age groups resulting in this ongoing revolution, ICT revolution. Therefore, we will, we're going to harness this and take advantage of this, um, um, all of this potential and ensure that we position, once again, position ourselves as the hub, the ICT hub of the sub-region. Therefore, in the short run, what do we envisage? We envisage the fostering and the integration of ICT nationwide, um, raising awareness of opportunities available in the ICT world, Introducing ICT at all levels of education to enhance a national ICT penetration rate. Construction of ICT baseline infrastructure, so increase the bandwidth, um, the internet availability to all our people. Integrating ICT into daily business. Enacting laws to govern ICT development and protect copyrights. Rewarding excellence with scholarships and employment. Creating comprehensive ICT training pools across the nation. Enhancing credit access, credit access to ICT service providers, as well as creating viable research partnerships with cutting edge ICT giants across the world. In the medium and long run, our policy action will include to the active embrace 
embracing of e-governance to drive public service delivery, establish ICT specialized universities for training and research, support ICT research, create ICT hubs in all the counties, in all 13 counties, and drive ICT penetration by at least 85% by 2030. We're going to track ICT performance through its penetration rate, assessing its cost and affordability, examining its contribution, examining its contribution to national income. Okay, thanks. number of ICT literates in the country, as well as innovations and technological advancement. Now we move from the ICT sector to the manufacturing sector. And what is our policy thrust? We're going to identify gaps in the manufacturing industry and invest so that our people can then claim and own those, manufacturing, um, those areas of manufacture that we can leverage up and to be able to make good business out of. Therefore, um, we are going to invest in SMEs uh, as part of our growth, economic growth. Um, when we look at the potential for our country, we see um, that engaging in exploitation and transformation of raw material is one of them. We want to be able to pursue industrialization strategies that modernize the agricultural and services sectors. We want to partner with foreign investors and provide incentives to attract foreign investment, explore opportunities of exploiting unused raw material, for instance, and I made mention of avocado as being one of them, and out of avocado, we have avocado oil byproduct used for producing butter, cosmetics, and we aim to produce at least 500,000 metric tons of avocado oil every year. Now, the, talking about the potential, we also see um, a lot of potential in agricultural resources, in water resources, in oil and gas, in solid minerals, large neighboring markets across, being our neighbors, the, the market across our as, as large and cheap labor that is available. Now, based on this potential at our disposal, we are looking at a short run policy action, which includes to identify and take stock of all potential resources of raw material currently being exploited by our people, and to ensure that exploitation is accompanied by good wages, provide infrastructure, um, provide infrastructure that will enable this material to be exploited and, and transported to the market, um, favorable tax and tax holidays to companies that want to venture into, into new costly transformation processes, open risk and development centers, um, make laws and regulations that prohibit risky environmental practices, as well as open research and development centers and faculties in our different university schools. In the long, in the medium and long term, we envisage the identification of all potential sources of agriculture Law, raw materials yet to be exploited. Make each country a manufacturing, make each county a manufacturing and transformation unit based on the potential and opportunities um, at its disposal. Install industries and transformation units closer to potential sources of transformation. Pursue industrialization strategies that modernize the agricultural and services sector. Um, install quality control to meet international standard, intensify transformation of byproducts of petroleum products, as well as open up research centers and engineering departments for food technology. Now the mining sector, 
as you know, we do have quite some resources in that, in that area. And our policy thrust will include the exploiting, exploitation and mining, uh, ex exploitation, mining and transforming all the environmental friendly minerals and making the country highly industrialized. Introduce beneficiation as an integral part of Amazonian policy thrust. Therefore, every county that makes up part of our country will ensure that whatever minerals are exploited from that county ensures that a certain percentage must benefit the, the people of that county. It becomes a very important part of our policy thrust. Mineral potentials include clay for ceramics, roof tiles and others located around the Ndop Plain as well as Mayom Binka, gold located in Misaje, Misaje and the Mamfi, kaolin located in Momo Division, copper, lead, zinc, marble, and as well as at least 600,000 tons of limestone, pozzolana, and reserves for pure sand for glass production in the volcanic areas, iron ore located in Mayobinka with diamond, gold, red, and blue stones across this region, uranium located in some counties which have been identified, as well as limestone and marble located in the south region, Moko, Mbalangi, Bobong, Bogong, Bojongo, um, as well as in Mamfe where we've got nephilene cyanide. There is aluminum quartzite and pyroclast, pyroclast in some counties as well. So all of these are the potentials we have in terms of minerals. Now in the short term, what do we envisage? To identify and take stock of the potential sources of minerals that are at our disposal, make laws and regulations guide the exploration and exploitation of our minerals, ensure and encourage private-public partnerships, provide incentives for exploration, incentive to in attract foreign investors, for favorable tax and tax holidays to, to companies to come invest, identifying the danger zones and relocation of populations from these zones, ensure proper disposal of environmental uh, waste, as well as managing the budget and revenue windfalls. In the medium and long run, what do we envisage? We identify the potential mineral, mineral reservoirs, intense exploration of environmental friendly minerals, well, we, we made mention of clay, install industries and uh, transformation units closer to mines, pursue industrialization strategies that modernize the mining sector, quality control to meet international standard, intensify exploration of gas, open research and development centers, Develop departments of geology and geomining in our universities, as well as insurance policies for all of this. Now, having spoken about the natural resources that we have as a people and as a country, and all the benefits that come with it, we have established that perhaps, and unarguably, our biggest asset is our human resources. When you take away the natural resources, we are confident that as a nation and as a people, we will still thrive. 56 years of deprivation and pushing our people out of the country in their droves have enabled our people to garner and to gain skills in various, in various sectors of the professional life. And we are therefore confident that if we are able to repatriate all of these skills back to our country, even without the natural resources, we would still be a very rich nation by investing in the services sector. Therefore, we envisage the building of a services hub in the sub-region and leveraging on our human resources. We've looked at the banking sector um, as, a, as an important sector which we can position ourselves in the sub-region sub to service the different countries across us within the banking sector, the services sector as in a general sense. Use of infrastructure as a major catalyst of investment. We think with our road infrastructure and all the others that we'll put in place, it will attract foreign direct investment and it will attract foreign businesses to want to come and invest in our country as easy access and, like I said, the gateway to the Central African region. Um, we also envisage, as part of the human resources we'll put in place, the protection of our, our territorial integrity, and that means that we'll introduce military service to all our citizens between the ages of 18 to 25 as part of the safeguarding of our nation's interests. Based on this, we think that if we put in place all the plans necessary, 
um, we are able to move away from policy to action, and each and every one of our citizens contributes, not only in terms of cash, but also in kind and their know-how. We are very confident that in the next few years, when we find ourselves back in Boya, we will be able to build our nation and not only talk about the restoration of our statehood, but we'll talk about what we want to offer the world and what difference we want to make. And when Africa starts to talk about the 55th of its nation state, we would be that 55th state that is not just a territory, but a territory that comes with something that is offering the rest of the world, especially our neighbors and the rest of the African continent. We require just dedication, good and prudent management, accountability, and transparency in all that we do in order to emerge in 2030. May the good Lord, may the good Lord lead us to Boya and thereafter. Thank you very much.